Hi everyone, my name is Katie Cantrell and I'm the founder of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. We're a nonprofit based in San Francisco, California, and we're dedicated to educating the public about the impacts of factory farming. So how many of you sang Old McDonald's when you were kids? Raise your hands. Pretty much everybody, right? When you walk into a grocery store and you look around at the pictures on products, it looks like Old McDonald's still being used today. There's all those rolling green hills, all those happy cows. But as I'm going to talk to you about today, that's not what farming is actually like anymore in this country. So here's an outline of what I'll be discussing. Going to go over the basics of factory farming, how it got started, what the different industries look like, um, egg, chicken, pork, and dairy, and then talk about the impacts on workers, the environment, and what we as consumers can do. So rather than on McDonald, this is what we have today. 99% of all animal products made in the United States are raised on factory farms. So what is factory farming exactly? It's technically known as concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. It's the practice of confining thousands of animals in a single barn to produce the most product for the lowest cost. So here you see egg, beef, pork, and chicken factory farms. The basics of factory farming actually began in the 1920s with the invention of vitamin supplements. This allowed animals to be raised indoors with supplements, like vitamin D, rather than outside, as humans had always done. Factory farming really got started in the 1950s with the post-war culture and consumerism. The development of different types of machines and antibiotics have allowed for the growth of factory farming. So light and air filtration systems ensure that animals never need to see the light of day or breathe fresh air, and antibiotics ensure that no matter how unsanitary the conditions, the animals won't die off in large numbers. Family farmers have largely become a thing of the past thanks to factory farms. More than half a million hog farmers have gone out of business in the past 25 years. Four companies control a majority of cow, pig, and chicken production. And two companies have patents on three quarters of all of the genetics for all chickens raised for meat in the entire world. So as you can see, it's really just a handful of corporations controlling this entire part of our food system. There is one advantage to this system, and that's cheap food. In the past 50 years, the average price of a new house has increased nearly 1,500%, but eggs and chicken meat haven't even doubled in that time. So people who work in ag for agribusiness, people who defend it, will say that they're helping the world by producing cheap food. But as we'll see, the factory farming comes at a steep price. Okay, so any guesses as to how many animals are raised and killed for food every year in the United States? Millions. <laughs> it's actually even more than that. Nearly 10 billion animals are raised and killed for meat, eggs, and milk every year in the United States. And that's just land mammals just in the United States. The figure is closer to 60 billion animals worldwide. And as you can see, the vast majority of these animals are raised on factory farms. Also, fun fact, the average American consumes the equivalent of 21,000 entire animals in his or her lifetime. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to go through and talk about what life is like for some of these 10 billion animals. And I'm going to be describing the actual life stories of individual animals that have been rescued by Animal Place Sanctuary in Grass Valley, California. So we're going to start by talking about chickens, specifically layer hens. So this is Lucy the layer hen. And Lucy is a layer hen, so that means that she's been bred to produce as many eggs as possible. Shortly after she was born, she had her beak cut off without anesthetic. This is a process called de-beaking. In natural conditions, chickens develop a peaceful hierarchy, so you've probably heard of a pecking order. But in confinement, there's not enough space for the chickens to maintain their normal social relations, so they take out their stress physically by pecking at or sometimes even cannibalizing the other birds. So in order to prevent injury, the farmers preemptively cut off their beaks. Now we'll see a quick video of what this looks like. Um, there won't be any blood, it's not gory, but I just want to give you an idea of what the industrialization process looks like. Okay. So. so this is a machine that actually uses a laser to cut off the chicken's beaks. And their beaks are their primary means of sensory exploration, so this is really debil debilitating for them as well as painful. So this is certainly a far cry from what most people imagine when they think of farming. 
And one theme that we'll see throughout this presentation is that the unnatural conditions of factory farming often lead to problems that create even more unnatural solutions, like cutting off chicks' beaks. So once Lucy got big enough, she was put into a cage like you see here. This is called a battery cage. She was kept in this cage with eight other chickens and a barn full of 50,000 other chickens, all in these cages. So in that cage, Lucy lay about 300 eggs per year, which is three times what she normally would in nature. Her body began to give out after a year or two of these stressful and unnatural conditions. And then at that point, usually all of the chickens are sent off to slaughter to become chicken noodle soup, frozen dinners, things like that. But actually, Lucy was a special case. Uh, she lived in a factory farm near Modesto, California, and the farmer actually went bankrupt, so he abandoned his chickens. He left 50,000 chickens to, to starve to death in one of these barns. Um, so 17,000 of them actually died before animal control was able to come in. Um, thankfully, Animal Place came in. They rescued 4,000 of the chickens, and Lucy was one of them. So she gets to live out the rest of her natural life, pecking at dirt and sunlight. Um, but that's a fate that 97% of chickens in this country will never see. So you may wonder, what about Lucy's brothers? What about the male chicks? They obviously don't lay eggs, and they also don't get big enough to be valuable for meat production. So what to do with them? All male layers, which is half of all the layer chickens born in the United States every year, more than 250 million, are literally discarded, which is what you see here. So they're, they're thrown into dumpsters alive um, to starve to death, or sometimes they're ground up in wood chippers and fed back to chickens as byproduct. Um, so this is one byproduct of the egg industry that not very many people know about. Okay, so we've reached our first cuteness interlude. This is a good chance to Take a breath. I know it's a lot of difficult information, and I really appreciate you taking the time to sit through it. So just take a minute. This is also a great time to write down any questions or thoughts that you have. OK, so now we're going to move on and talk about broiler chickens. These are the chickens raised for meat. And they actually have slightly better lives than the chickens raised for eggs because they're kept in barns by the thousands rather than in those battery cages. So they have, on average, a single square foot of space to move around in. Our chicken has been bred to grow bigger than ever before, more quickly than ever before. The average daily growth rate of broiler chickens has increased roughly 400% since 1935. We can see evidence of that right here. So these are pictures of chickens and their relative breast sizes in 1957, 1997, and 2007. So as you can imagine, this unnaturally large growth and quick growth is really stressful for chickens' bodies. They didn't evolve to grow that big, let alone that quickly. So, as a result, there's a 26% chance the chickens will be severely crippled and a 90% chance that they won't be able to walk normally. All right, so once our chickens, both broiler and egg laying, are spent or they're ready to be slaughtered, um, they're first loaded into crates on trucks, like you see here. According to the average rates, a worker should create 105 chickens in 3.5 minutes. So obviously, in order to work that quickly, the birds have to be handled roughly. So they're grabbed by their legs and slung into these crates that you see here. As a result, there's a 30% chance that our chickens will have freshly broken bones by the time that they arrive at the slaughterhouse. Other countries, including all of the European Union, require that animals be rendered unconscious prior to slaughter in order to ensure a quick and relatively painless death. And that's true for most animals in the United States. However, chickens and turkeys are actually exempt from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, which is basically the only animal welfare legislation that even applies to farm animals in the first place. So as a result, chickens and turkeys are stunned before they're slaughtered, but enough to paralyze them to keep them from flapping around and getting stuck in the machines, but not enough to actually render them unconscious. After that, they have their throat slit, and ideally they die of blood loss. Then they're put through a scalding tank of boiling hot water, and their feathers are removed. However, as I said, that's if it's done properly. According to the National Chicken Council, 180 million chickens are improperly slaughtered each year. And we have to assume that this is a really conservative estimate since it's coming from the National Chicken Council. Government estimates state that about 4 million birds are alive and fully conscious when they go into the scalding tank, where they're then boiled alive. So any time that we eat chicken or products made with eggs in a restaurant, we have no way of knowing whether they were one of those millions that's boiled alive every year. So you might wonder, what about free range? According to the USDA standards, in order to qualify as free range, a shed with 30,000 chickens on it and a tiny door on one end that opens onto a three-foot dirt patch 
can count as free range. It can be labeled as free range. So USDA certified free range is entirely meaningless. This is a picture of a, a factory farm that meets the USDA cage free standards. And I mean, it's true that chickens aren't in cages, but this still isn't exactly what most people imagine when they hear cage free or free range. Okay, so we've reached another cuteness interlude. Mm -hmm. Take another moment, write down any questions or thoughts you have. Okay, so now we're gonna move on and talk about dairy. So this is Sadie the dairy cow. She's from Animal Place again, and she's the best damn cow that Animal Place has ever had, according to one of their workers, or one of their managers. So just some basics for you. Cows, like all mammals, only produce milk when they're pregnant or nursing in order to feed to their offspring. Humans are the only species that consume milk after infancy, and we're definitely the only species that regularly consumes a different species' milk. It's actually a little strange when you stop and think about it. So, in order for humans to get large quantities of milk from cows, they must first be artificially impregnated. This is done using forcible artificial insemination, using a device that the industry itself calls the rape rack. So, there's a real feminist concern about exploiting these female animals solely for their reproductive systems. As soon as Sadie's calf was born, it was taken away from her just a day after it was born, when it was just a day old. Um, so this is an undercover investigation of, um, similarly, a calf being taken away from its mother just hours after it was born. And the, uh, it's loading, but we'll see it in a minute. The reason that this is done is because if we allowed the calves to drink their mother's milk, there wouldn't be as much to sell to humans for profit. So as the worker is about to describe, this is extremely traumatic for both the cows and the calves. So as you can imagine, there's nothing that the mothers want more than to nurse their babies, but they're not given that opportunity. So after Sadie's calves were taken away from her, the female calves were raised to be dairy cows. That's what you see in this picture on the left. And I've often driven by these crates up in Petaluma in California, um, where there's a lot of dairy operations, and I often wondered, what are those things? And then I found out that actually th these are where the female calves are kept until they're big enough to be dairy cows, until they're mature enough to be artificially inseminated. They're kept in these tiny crates, and they're not allowed any contact with their mother or when, with any other calves. The male calves are either auctioned off for meat or sold to veal farms. So this is a veal farm that you see here on the right. Now, a lot of people choose not to eat veal because it's widely known as one of the crueler animal products, but most people don't realize that the veal industry is actually a byproduct of the dairy industry. So once Sadie's calves were taken away from her, she was hooked up to a machine that took her milk three times a day, the milk that was intended for her calf. After 10 to 12 months of being milked like this, she was again artificially impregnated, her calf was again taken from her, and she's again milked three times a day. And this happens to the cows year after year until either they can no longer produce a valuable amount of milk or they can no longer be impregnated. And then at that point, they're sent off to, to slaughter to become hamburger meat, Chef Boyardee, things like that. Um, but luckily, Sadie was rescued, so she lived out the rest of her natural life at Animal Place. And the cuteness interlude. <laughs> now, I know that a lot of this information is really difficult, and I really appreciate you taking the time to sit through and hear this information. Um, luckily, dairy is really one of the easiest issues to address um, by boycotting it, by letting the milk, the calves drink the milk. Um, there's almond milk, hemp milk, oat milk, rice milk, almond milk. There's just so many different dairy alternatives that it's really one easy step to take to help the situation. So luckily, there's a concrete action that we can take. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to our last animal industry, and that is pigs. So this is Ruby the pig, another rescued animal place animal. And just some background for you, pigs are really friendly and social animals. They're actually more intelligent than dogs. They're incredibly smart, very friendly. So Ruby's mother was a sow, a female birthing pig on a factory farm. She spent the 16 weeks of her pregnancy confined in a gestation crate, which is what you see there on the left. Pigs often go insane from boredom and isolation in these crates. It's also highly unsanitary. 
As you can imagine, she can't go someplace else to go to the bathroom since she doesn't move from that crate for 16 weeks. So she's standing on a slatted floor and all of her uh, urine and feces goes directly beneath her into giant pits. You can see the filth leaking out onto this walkway. As you can imagine, this causes an awful stench and a really painful ammonia buildup that's dangerous for both pigs and workers who often experience chronic bronchitis when working on pig factory farms. After giving birth, the pigs are confined to farrowing crates, which are just as restrictive as gestation crates, and actually sometimes they're even kept strapped to the floor while they're in these farrowing crates. So here, they're forced to continuously nurse their piglets without being allowed any other form of contact with them. This picture that we see here on the left is a natural pig's nest, so she's kind of gathered up hay and straw, she's nuzzling her piglets, and then here you see a farrowing crate. So, within the first 10 days after being born, the piglets have their tails cut off without anesthetic. This is a process called tail docking. And it's just like with chicken debeaking, where pigs become stressed from the confined conditions and they show aggression by biting each other's tails. So the farmers preemptively cut off their tails and the sharp parts of their teeth. And then about 15 days later, uh, the male pigs will have their testicles torn out, again without pain relief. So by the time farmers begin weaning them, 15% of the pigs will actually have died from stress and injuries from these practices. So here you see a picture of a piglet having its tail cut off without anesthetic. Mm. So it's, it's good to think about why we choose to treat some animals a certain way and some animals a different way. So imagine keeping a pregnant dog locked in a closet for 16 weeks. Or imagine cutting off a puppy's tail without anesthetic. These would all be felony animal cruelty when done to animals that we keep as pets, when done to animals that are actually even smarter than dogs. It's legal just because we choose to eat them. I'm not saying we should decide how animals are treated based on their intelligence. All mammals have the same part of the brain for registering pain and basic emotions, and it's really that capacity for suffering that matters, but it's still good food for thought, if you will. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the impact on workers. I'm going to start by describing the average life story of a slaughterhouse worker. So Luis was a corn farmer in Mexico. When the United States flooded Mexico with cheap corn, thanks to free trade agreements like NAFTA, Luis couldn't earn a living from farming anymore. One day, he heard an ad on the radio promising him a better life in the United States, good wages, housing, a chance at the American dream. So he boards the free bus that Tyson has chartered to drive him from Mexico to Nebraska to work at a slaughterhouse. Once Luis reaches the United States, however, he realizes that he has been cruelly misled. The wages are incredibly low, he faces one of the most dangerous jobs in the country, and yet he's not given any health insurance. Since the 1970s, slaughterhouse workers' jobs have become highly specialized, which means they're doing one motion over and over and over every day. So this leads to um, cumulative trauma, repetitive stress injuries that can cause pain for the rest of these workers' lives. Um, the companies purposely use intimidation tactics and hire undocumented workers in order to keep them from unionizing, to ask for higher wages or health insurance. So these workers will often find themselves disfigured, um, unable to work for the rest of their lives with no health insurance. Also, the job is extremely traumatic. I mean, you can imagine we wouldn't want to work slaughtering animals day after day. And they often develop post-traumatic stress disorder from seeing so much death on a regular basis, and many of them turn to alcohol to try to numb this pain. So believe it or not, there's actually a job that could be considered even worse than the, average, than the regular slaughterhouse work, and that's the job of the late night cleaning crew. So these people arrive at midnight, and by sunrise, they have to clean the remains of the three to 4,000 cattle that have been slaughtered at the plant that day. They clean using a hose that shoots a mixture of 180 degree water and chlorine. And they have to clean while all of the conveyor belts and slaughtering mechanisms and everything are running to get all of the blood out from in between them. So you can imagine just how dangerous this job is. I'm just going to give you one example. At a national beef plant in Kansas, a man climbed into a blood collection tank 30 feet high to clean it, but he was overcome by the hydrogen sulfide fumes and actually fell into the tank. Two other workers climbed into the tank to try to rescue him, but all three men drowned. Eight years earlier, another worker had been overcome by the fumes in that same tank, and another man had died trying to save him. So for this, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration actually fined national beef for its negligence but the fine, $480 for each man's death. So clearly even the government regards these workers as completely expendable. 
So even if we don't care whatsoever about the animals that are subjected to these conditions, what about the people? What about these workers? Why pay companies to exploit immigrants who offer suffer hideous injuries or are even killed? Okay. Another cuteness interlude. Take a moment. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to switch gears again and talk about our last subject, which is the environment. Talk about a few different things. And we'll start with deforestation. So in, in the United States, more than 260 million acres of forest have been clear cut for animal agriculture. And actually, it's even worse in Brazil. Every year, about 6 million acres of rainforest are cut down to make grazing land for cattle or land to grow corn and soy to feed to livestock. So as you can see, between the land that's grown to feed, um, the land that's used to grow crops to feed to livestock, and the land that's actually used for grazing, uh, animal agriculture accounts for 30% of the use of the Earth's entire land surface. Speaking of corn and soy, according to the, um, the USDA, in 2000 there were 72 million acres of corn and 72 million acres of soy harvested, but only 2 million acres of other vegetables. Does anyone want to guess how much of that soy crop was fed to livestock, percentage-wise? <laughs> yes, it's a lot. 98% of the soy crop grown in the United States is fed to livestock, as is 44% of the corn crop. It's the single largest source of corn consumption in the United States as well. So in a nutshell, this is why Big Macs are cheaper than salads. The government's actually subsidizing corn and soy to grow to feed to livestock, um, whereas fruits and vegetables are deemed specialty crops, and so they don't receive subsidies. So basically farmers can't really afford to grow anything besides corn and soy anymore. So corn and soy are extremely cheap, and as a result animal products, which are also subsidized, are really cheap. Whereas most Americans can't access or can't afford uh, as many fruits and vegetables as we're supposed to eat. This monoculture uh, system, growing just corn and soy, is also really bad for the environment. So proper land management techniques require raising a variety of crops, um, tilling different crops. So raising just corn and soy results in nearly 10 times as much soil erosion. So our soil is literally blowing away because we're not using proper land management. Also, monoculture leads to higher rates of insects and fungus, so it necessitates higher pesticide use. As a result, more than 70% of the U.S. soy crop is Monsanto's GMO Roundup Ready soy. Um, I won't go into all of the problems with Monsanto today. I highly urge you to look them up on Wikipedia if you don't know them. But a lot of people who care about food politics would never knowingly choose to support Monsanto. And many people often try to avoid GMO products. But people often don't realize that by eating animal products, there's a really good chance that we're supporting Monsanto's GMO soy. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about climate change. So this is a graph from the Environmental Working Group that shows the carbon footprint of four ounces of, of food consumed, according, um, and it's charted against how many car miles that's equivalent to being driven. Um, so as you can see here, all of the all meat products are on the bottom, um, whereas the, the least uh, carbon intensive foods are lentils and veggies. So the three worst foods in terms of greenhouse gas emissions are cheese, beef, and lamb. So eating four ounces of beef has 12 times as many emissions as eating four ounces of, say, tofu. As a result of all this, a recent study by the University of Chicago found that consuming no animal products is 50% more effective at fighting global warming than switching from a standard car to a hybrid. So theoretically, anyway, a vegan driving a Hummer is actually doing more to stop global warming than an omnivore driving a Prius. So you might wonder, well, why exactly is factory farming so bad for the environment? And one of the main reasons is poop. So farm animals in the US produce 130 times as much waste as the entire US human population. So imagine if every man, woman, and child just urinated and defecated into giant open air pits all year round, and that's pretty much what you have on factory farms. Um, the, one of the reasons that beef especially is so bad for the environment is that um, their poop, and also they fart a lot, and that has a lot of methane, and methane is 20 times more potent in climate change than carbon dioxide. So you might wonder, what happens to all of this poop? As you can see here, each of these barns has about 9,000 pigs in it, 
and there are nine of these barns. So all of their poop is pumped right here into this 20 million gallon manure lagoon. And as you can see, there are four or five more of these lagoons in the background. So what do you think happens if it rains or if it's windy? As you can probably imagine, all of this waste pollutes local water sources. According to the EPA, 35,000 miles of river in 22 states have been polluted by factory farming. So this picture that you see here is a confirmed case of illegal factory farm discharge. Uh, it's from Hudson, Michigan. This brown that you see is manure and the white that you see is an algae bloom. So excess levels of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen in the manure encourage algae to grow and that depletes the water of oxygen and completely kills off all of the fish. And as you can imagine, just wrecks local ecosystems. Um, 13 million fish have been killed in only three years by factory farming runoff. One of the main reasons that there's so much pollution is that it's actually cheaper for companies to purposely dump this waste into public waterways than to actually pay to have it treated properly. And there's very little federal regulations and even less punishment. Um, so it's basically accepted for companies to do this. Smithfield, the world's largest pork producer, um, actually was given the highest fine for polluting public waterways. That was partly because they covered up documents and lied in federal court about it. Um, and they actually had 7,000 violations of the Clean Water Act. So clearly when it's done on that scale, it's intentional. And it's ironic because these products are cheap in part because companies are passing on the true environmental and public health costs onto the very people who are buying these products. Environmental racism is another really serious result of factory farming. Can you imagine what it would be like to live next door to a factory farm? You couldn't open your windows because of the stench. There's fly clouds in the summer, there's manure runoff in the winter. Your family suffers from asthma, headaches, nosebleed from breathing in all of that fecal matter and ammonia. And the people who are subjected to these conditions are almost always low-income communities of color, the very people who can afford it the least. Okay, so we've reached our last cuteness interlude. One last chance to jot down any questions. All right, so the bottom line of this presentation is that every purchase in a supermarket and every order for a menu is inevitably and powerfully linked with agricultural policy. So every time that we make a decision about food, we're farming by proxy. So we have a choice. If we're outraged by Smithfield's 7,000 violations of the Clean Water Act, we can boycott Smithfield. If we're outraged by the terrible worker conditions or the fact that animals smarter than dogs are kept strapped to the floor, we can boycott those products. Factory farms will continue to thrive and pollute and exploit workers and animals as long as consumers are directly paying them to by buying their products. So the upside of this is that we can take action three times a day just by buying and eating products that don't support factory farming. So the most thorough boycott is to go vegan, just say, I don't want any animal products, I don't want to have to worry about whether or not this is really free range or what that means, I'm just not going to eat any of it. Um, but remember, you don't have to label yourself as vegan in order to put soy milk in your cereal. You don't have to self-identify as vegetarian in order to order a veggie burger at a restaurant. I think people often default to the non-veg options just because they don't self-identify as such, but increasingly more and more people are starting to be flexitarians, where they will default to the more sustainable, humane, and healthy option, especially when it's an easy choice. So I highly recommend vegweb.com. It's a vegan recipe database. You can type in whatever you want to make. It generates recipes. They're all rated. They have comments. You can see what are people's favorites. Um, I'd suggest trying making vegan baked goods. They're really delicious. They're cheaper to make. They're healthier, no cholesterol. Plus, they don't cause thousands of miles of river pollution, and no calves were separated from their mothers in order to make them. So really, it's a win-win. There's all sorts of creative ways you can experiment with decreasing your animal product intake. So a lot of people do Meatless Mondays. That's a really popular and growing movement around the country. A lot of restaurants are participating in that. Mark Bittman from the New York Times also advocates vegan before five, so vegan for breakfast and lunch, not necessarily for dinner. There's all sorts of different ways. I really just encourage you to experiment with your diet. Try out some new products and see what works best for you. I know that it can be difficult to consider decreasing animal product intake because animal products are really integral to our society and they taste really good. So it's easier to just enjoy them and ignore where they come from rather than to actually confront the impacts of their consumption. Mm. So some people often ask, well, what difference can one person really make? You know, my, you know, we live in a country with millions of people, my one choice doesn't actually make a difference. And the good news is that it does. 
Oh, for over 60 years, me meat consumption steadily rose. But what we've actually seen in the past five years, this trend is reversing. So finally, meat consumption is decreasing. And that's because individual consumers have decided, hey, you know, for health reasons, for the environment, for animals, I don't want to eat as much meat. And so because of that flexitarian movement, Meatless Mondays, um, for the first time, we're seeing a decrease in meat production. And this also means that there's an increase in demand for healthy plant-based options. And the more consumer demand there is for those products, the more widely available they'll be. So one consumer really can make a difference. OK, so here's that last quote that I wanted to leave you with. Just how destructive does a culinary preference have to be before we decide to eat something else? If contributing to the suffering of billions of animals that live miserable lives and quite often die in horrific ways isn't motivating, what would be? If being the number one contributor to the most serious threat facing the planet, climate change, isn't enough, what is? And if you're tempted to put off these questions of conscience, to say not now, then when? So remember that every time you decide not to eat an animal product, you're taking action against one of the most destructive industries on the planet. Okay. So that's the end of our presentation. I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to watch. And you can visit our website, uh, ffacoalition.org, to learn more about our work. And we also have some great res resources on there, Meatless Mondays, Recipes, uh, Vegetarian Restaurant Finder. And we would love to hear from you. So please, all those questions that you jotted down during the presentation, um, please feel free to email them to us, info at ffacoalition.org. And we'd also love to hear your thoughts, your feedback. And we make our presentation available, the presentation and script available as a resource to people around the country who want to spread this information. And if you're, if you're located in the San Francisco Bay Area, we'd also love to give this presentation at your school, your work, your organization, you know, community meeting, anything like that. So please send us emails. We would love to hear from you. Thank you so much.